15 years on from that magical night in Estoril, this one's for Fausto. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Oh, never has a MotoGP win caught me right in the feels like that. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 345 of Motorsport 101. I'm your friendly neighborhood host, Dre Harrison, and welcome to the latest I have ever recorded a podcast. So I'm trying to be a little quieter than normal, and I thought I'd bring the mood line along if you're watching along on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, Welcome to Motorsport 101 After Dark. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, we, we we have we have sexy voices and even sexier co-hosts. With me as always, we have RJ O'Connell. Hello, sir. Pleasure to be here on this post watershed production. Um, <laughs> yeah, what a what a fantastic what a what a scintillating weekend of bikes, and it's so refreshing to hear the dulcet tones of friend of the show, Bike Live alum Lewis Sutterby on the world feed. So proud of him. Doing, doing fantastic. We are not worthy. We're all very Lu- proud of you, Lewis. I know you're listening to this. As I know you listen to every show, we couldn't be prouder of you, man. You were fantastic first weekend out of the bunch. Unfortunately, I'm stuck with BT Sport, but I made a specific effort to watch on Video Pass again just so I could listen to you. You crushed it, buddy. Um, very, I couldn't be proud of you, my friend. Congratulations, and uh, hey. The first one's always the hardest. It's only going to get better, I promise. Also with me, Ryan now Eric King. Hello, sir. Introduce the rest of the cast. <laughs> yes, glad, glad to be here. Uh, also, again, big big props to Son of me. Great job on commentary. Uh, definitely don't worry about any criticisms. By, by the time I reach Valencia, you're pretty much going to be a completely different commentator. Couldn't, couldn't be more proud. Cam, how you doing down there, buddy? Um, yeah, I'm very much enjoying this uh, episode of M101 After Dark or uh, ASMR 101, as we now should call yeah. it. Thank you, RJ. Um, uh, I can't speak because I had to watch the race on mute because I was at work while it was going on on yeah. break. Um, that- but that's okay. But uh, look, we know Lewis. He is nothing but quality. And I'm sure when I actually get a chance to hear your voice on the broadcast, it'll be very, very enjoyable indeed. Very enjoyable. Indeed. Also, was that Grand Prix? Mm. Yeah. You want to talk about, you know, everybody, all these basketball people that say, you know, who's going to, who's the, who's the next Michael Jordan? They've been saying this now for about almost 20 years. Who's the mm. next Michael Jordan? Well, none of these guys are like Michael Jordans because, I mean, they're not basketball players, but. I think we did find, uh, and you saw it on like the front of the winner's bike. We did find the Nets twenty three. Well, he did a damn sight better than Michael Jordan's uh, motorcycle racing team ever did. Yeah, that is that is true. We are. It is a step in the right direction. We're going to review what was a historic uh, season opener for MotoGP in Qatar this past weekend. We'll be talking about. How it wasn't really Plan A, or should that say, should that be L Plan A for Ducati, um, as that has the way the weekend played out. Who failed the vibe check? Uh, as, as if he come off this, some controversy in the junior classes because that never happens in Moto Three, never, no. Oh, no. Um, and again, we'll we'll give our overall thoughts on the race weekend as always. So. Before we get started on that, places you can find us are real quick. We're on youtube.com forward slash motorsport101. We're on facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. Our personal handles for Twitter are on the screen right now. If you if you can't listen, if you're listening in via audio, that's at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, at CBuckley917, and at Ryan Eric King. Our, our podcast is, uh, Twitter account is at motorsport underscore 101, and you can find all the details and all of that and our Patreon information as well on our website, motorsport101.com, including our Instagram as well, motorsport101pod. Check that out if you haven't already. You get all the updates of all our content as well, including me, because I spoke a lot about this race on the website as well. That was fun to talk about. So check that out as well, motorsport101.com, for all of that good stuff. As uh, RJ appeals to our ASMR slide with some rumbling keys. You'd love to see it. Uh, that's right. So- that's right. We're, uh, we're gi- we're, I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving you the keys to take us into our MotoGP review. He, he said it. Beautiful segue. Right after this, let's talk MotoGP in Qatar. Hmm. Whew, 
Wee. <laughs> so, who saw that one coming? Um, not me. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, uh, we didn't see that one coming. The, the shocker of the weekend. Anaya Bastianini qualifies second in Q2, right at the death of that qualifying session, just behind Jorge Martin on pole. Goes on to win relatively comfortably somehow. Also, while on last year's bike, we talked about this in our season preview, um, that Grassini is on the GP21 still, and uh, there's some confusion regarding the setup of these Ducatis we'll get into very shortly as well. But amazingly, that was the only Ducati that was in the points um, because of the way the race played out. Van Yaya crashed. He took Jorge Martin with him. Jack Miller had a technical DNF. The electronics on his bike failed, um, which is pretty catastrophic for a MotoGP bike to be giving you 100% yeah. power in the wrong spots. Um, not ideal. And DG Antonio was out of the points. That was my rookie of the year pick. Damn and blast. Um... Thy picks have been dreadful this year. Anyway, given how topsy-turvy their weekend was, just how happy will Ducati actually be with this weekend is what I wanted to ask you fellas. Oh, man. <laughs> like, obviously, you have to be ecstatic for Grassini <laughs> getting a win. But at the Great. back of your mind... Big to be somewhat worried that the first Ducati win of the year was not from the new bike, but from the 2021 bike. To expand on that, King, it's not just not the new bike. They've also reverted, we touched on this a little bit in our season preview, to a older spec of their engine on the factory bikes this year. And those didn't work out either. No. Factory team was not competitive pretty much the entire weekend. Like, Banyaya was struggling to crack the top 10 pretty much the entire weekend. To clarify, yeah, they, Davide Tardozzi admitted to BT Sport on Friday morning. Yeah, we're kind of running a hybrid version of our 21 and 22 engines. In uh, this, is, this is literally his words in English. To be, It's like a hybrid of our 21 and 22 engines on the factory team. And then when they asked him about Pramac, their, their B team, they said, oh, I've got the full 22 engine. So there are three different calibrations of Ducati Desmond Deshi in the field as we speak. And they're locked into that for the entire yeah, season. Yeah, you have a because. Yeah, your homologate as a team. Apparently, it was Banyaya's call to say, "Can we go back?" <laughs> and uh, Ducati was like, "No, okay, no." We'll Ducati back. said, "Ducati said that was," and I'm quoting here, "bullshit." Really? Like, yes. I don't buy that for a minute because no, Banyaya was very vocal during the test. Um, well, I, he, I, he, I, I, I think he had input, but. For a decision that huge, I don't think he was the go-ahead voice. I, I hope he wasn't. I hope he wasn't. I'd be very concerned if I mean, he did. Historically, teams will go with their number one rider, whether you consider whether they have a number one rider or not, but typically they go with that uh, decision. Mm. But uh, either way, it's a weird one. First race for Grassini with Ducati. They win. They win at a canter at the end of the day with uh, with Bastianini, who we we saw flashes mm. of this um, throughout the end of last year. A couple podiums, um, pretty much permanently the top independent near the end of the year. But dang, opening the year with a win, stunning. You love to see and. It. Uh... And an emotional one as well. I mean, fun fact for those guys behind the scenes here. Like, I know it's past midnight in the UK, but it isn't for the Americans on the show. We're recording this on International Women's Day on March 8th. And, uh, yeah, for those who may have forgotten, Fausto Grassini passed away just over a year ago due to complications from COVID-19. His widow, Nadia Padovani, ended up taking over the Grassini team after he passed away. And uh, if you were watching that race, she was already in floods of tears with two laps to go. And you're thinking, please, Adaya, please just bring this home. Bring um, and, and Brad Binder very nearly reeled him in on the final lap as well, which I thought would have been quite a funny a troll moment there. But you're not beating a Ducati in a straight line. But 
It's a special Maybe. moment. Not only was it 15 years since Grassini's last win as an independent, which you may remember when they were the Fortuna Honda team, when Tony Elias won that legendary race at Estoril in 2006 by two thousandths of a second, the closest finish in GP history, um, in the top flight anyway. Um, also, the first ever female team-led MotoGP win ever. Um, I, I did ask Lewis to have a look, dig around and check the stats on this. Yeah, it is the first ever female team principal led win in MotoGP history. So a little bit of history made there as well, which is cool to see. And she was on the podium to collect the winner's trophy as well, which was just fantastic scenes all around. It was a it was a powerful, powerful win and love to see that happen. Um, it's a weird one for Ducati. Like I said, from a manufacturer standpoint, purely... It's fine. You still get 25 for a win because your leading bike came over the line first. So from a constructor standpoint, yeah. you're fine. The conversations that are going to be had in the pack, are like um, feathers. This was not. This was. This was not ill plan. Um, this was not ill plan whatsoever. Um, the factory team didn't look great. The, the second team didn't look particularly great either. Um, Zarco just Whoa. got over the line in eighth. And that was I will it. counter that by saying that Martin was looking okay until a certain factory Ducati tucked the front and pinballed him into a retirement. Um, Martin's still extraordinarily quick in qualifying around here, but mm. it, it it's something that they're going to be dealing with, I, I believe, for a couple of races where when you take an engine that – the an engine and electronics package that are not designed to work with one another – especially mm. with their electronics being so refined from the past. And we see that with the GP21, that it's going to take them some time, having had no testing with this current hybrid bike, um, to really nail on you know, a working a working balance on that bike. And you could see it. Benyaya was visibly unhappy with the bike pretty much all weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a weird weekend. We, I mean, we'll get into some... Other parties that may or may not have failed vibe checks, but I, I just, I have nothing else to add about Enea Bastianini and Grassini racing and how awesome that was to see them finally win one because this is a team that has endured quite a lot of hardship. You could say that. Over the past two decades in MotoGP, you could say. And it's really good that they got one. Uh, and Bastianini just straight up outrode everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once he got to the back of Polo Spargaro, that was when we were thinking, hang on, he might actually do this. Yeah, the last this record. might not just be like, you know, you know, he it, great that he got on the front row. Now when's everybody else going to swallow him up? Because they're thinking maybe the factory bikes have something for him. Maybe the Repsol Hondas, now that Honda's got a good bike, maybe Suzuki has something. But no, Bastionini just straight up rode better than everybody else. <laughs> Yeah, Incredible and we saw stuff. kind of yeah. we saw kind of last year where he would qualify. He was not great in qualifying last year, but his race pace was bonkers in a couple of uh, late season rounds mm. last year, and um, he was able to put that, that together for a win. And I know that uh, I hope that wherever he is, um, Fausto had a big grin watching that his his did, bike uh, did, come across the line first. Mm. Dedicated the win to him on the podium afterwards. You could see an A point to the sky of the winner's trophy. It was a it was a very touching, lovely scene. And also I be, love that for them. Because we love him on this show as well. We I couldn't move on quick without mentioning Lord Binder in second place for KTM. Hey, your man. What a boy. <laughs> the Lord oh, has Lord. come through again in second on the KTM, which looked nowhere for most of the weekend, and Binder comes in second. I love that man. He's just too good at this. Like I don't know how he keeps pulling this off, but uh, Brad Binder, well, what a rider he is! Like I said, I said it on Twitter this morning. Most underrated rider in MotoGP. I don't care what you tell me. The man is fast as all hell. Um, so, so good, so good. Um, yeah, as mentioned, we had Binder on the podium. We had Paul Spargaro on the podium as well for Repsol Honda. Just his second podium with the team since joining them last year. Mark Marquez down in fifth. He struggled a little bit. Um, and Suzuki not at the front, despite a lot of preseason hype. And looking at one point... Despite having the fastest bike in a straight line. 
Yeah, which never happens turns it for 221 Suzuki. mph in a straight line over the course of this race. Um, with all that in mind, like after we just talked about Ducati and the issues they've got, are they leaving Qatar with the biggest cause for concern? Or has, did somebody fail the vibe check even harder? I want to know your thoughts, folks. <laughs> oh, Cam. Cam. You're, you're jumping in first because I have a feeling I know that there is a manufacturer that's going to come up in a lot there is, of uh, There is going to be one manufacturer check. catching a lot of strays here. Um, uh, it's the dark blue bikes because we had heard the displeasure from the number one man all throughout preseason testing, but they always seem to put something together despite their straight line speed deficit. Yamaha got cooked, boiled, roasted, broasted, and baked this weekend by everyone around them. Roasted. They barely, <laughs> they <washed>. barely <laughs> scraped. Did they even make the top 10 in qualifying? No. Uh, I mean, Franco Morbidelli got a free pass to Q. Yeah. He, Morbidelli got a free pass to Q2. That might have been the highlight for them this weekend. Yikes. Or, or was it that? <laughs> Was it was the highlight really Darren Bender not wrecking himself and no less than one other rider in the race, finishing on the lead lap, having a shot at points? Was that really the best that Yamaha might had? Be the best was Frank, that Yamaha was had. Fabio Quartararo, the reigning world champion, getting track raced over the line by Mister Silver Medal himself, Yoan Zarco. That can't I be. I will. Can't. Um, I will quote Fabio Quartararo when asked what went wrong. Nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> this isn't qualifying. The, 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 uh, okay, Qatar is always a bit of an outlier. But Yamaha annihilated the field here last year. Mm. Yamaha, generally speaking, goes very well in Qatar. They, like, it's, it's one of their strongest rounds um, going back years and years and years. I mean... Let me give you a, a rundown of their last results in the last 10 years. Before then, first, first, fifth, but they were 0.6 off the win. Third, but they were 0.7 off the win. First, 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 second, first, first, second. They don't lose here very often. This is one of their strongest. They won, they won both rounds here last year. Um, the stat that leapt off the page to me when I was doing research for this podcast was... The overall race time compared to last year's race in Doha was 10.7 seconds faster than last year. Fabio Quattararo finished 10.4 seconds off the win. Let's not forget Keep Maverick Vinales won that race last year. Yeah, like so. In other words, Keep in mind Yamaha that. has stood. Com yeah, they've stood completely still while everybody else around them has made gains. Here's the problem, though. The bike that won was a year-old Ducati. <laughs> Which is even worse. So, it's it's not good, is it? It's not good. No, it it it, it ain't great. Think is this good? <laughs> is this it, Chief? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm not gonna say I. Uh, we'd be stupid to write them off for the season, but given the trend of how they go here, they need something. Because the issue mm. for Yamaha is not necessarily a lack of power. The lack of power is a symptom, not the cause. If they put any more power in their engine maps, it, the bike just blows the rear tire off. It's been an issue since the Spec Electronic uh, and IMU came in uh, in 2017? Yes, yeah, 2017. Why did I doubt myself on that one? Yeah, it's, it's really... Yamaha needs to get on top of their electronics issues. I mean, go on for five years now. Quickly. And mm -hmm. it's at the point where the inline four excuse is dead and gone. Suzuki was passing Ducatis in a straight line this weekend. <laughs> and Aprilia's were probably going to be able to pass yeah. them both. Yeah. But I, I know it's easy to take the piss out of Aprilia in their concessions, but there was a scene in FP2 on Friday night where... Like on BT Sport, if you watch their coverage, they have Sylvain Gintoli, who's their test rider as part of the coverage, 
Ginters himself could not believe that a Ducati was getting passed in a straight line by a Suzuki. And like we yeah, all went, it, it oh made my God, the whole type. paddock go and like, huh? Because yeah, it was wild. Yeah, it's like Ducati's Ducati is a Ducati have a cornering monster and Suzuki have a straight line bullet. <laughs> this makes total sense. This is what happens when you cross nothing the makes beams. sense anymore in bike racing. Yeah, but this this is what happens when funky shit happens in GP. Suzuki weren't particularly great either, given that by Friday night we were thinking, could they one two this? Like, there's, like, a time attack under anger. Rins was quickest in FP2. Mir was third. They, they were passing anyone that cared in a straight line. And everyone thought, hang on, is Rins going to actually win this? Like, is Suzuki back? You know, they were... They, they, they the veiled Livio Sippo. He was doing press and media. And they're like, oh, my God, Suzuki's got their shit together here. And it just didn't happen on Saturday and Sunday. Apparently, Mir complained of a lack of rear grip. Um, so yeah, that was something they're going to get over as well. So I wanted to give an honorable mention to Suzuki because, uh, at one point I thought they were going to completely run the field over this weekend and they didn't, they ended up a modest, I think it was sixth and eighth in the end, um, well, sixth or seventh in the end. So yeah, just a bit disappointing for a team that, that got a lot of preseason attention going in on that one. So yeah, bizarre one that to say the least. Yamaha, in trouble, to say the least. I would say, wait till Europe before we really get a read on this. Um, because, like I said, Indonesia's a brand new round. The Americas kind of belong to Mr. 93. Haref? We should, we should touch on, uh, on we should touch on the uh, the other mm. orange bikes. Because, uh, mm. you know, for a brand new machine, leading the vast majority of the race... Not too bad for a debut for the new 213V. Definitely a diamond in the rough, though. There's a lot of things that could be smoother about it. Um, and they put both riders on the soft tire, which just melted in the final quarter. Last minute call. Last minute call after... Uh, yeah, admittedly, I uh, was thinking... I was thinking once they got the Repsol Hondas up in front, I was thinking, right, this is done and dusted. And then it wasn't. Yeah. They weren't getting away. Definitely. Yeah, I, I don't think... Get it. They're still learning a new bike. Uh, Mark admitted himself he has actually the setup from the Mandalika test just because he needs more time on the this bike to figure out what the front of it does. It's very, very different. Mm. So it should be terrifying for everyone else that they're this good this early on that what is self-admitted kind of a bike that's still in the final stages of its development went out and beat... Mm everything that wasn't a KTM with Brad Bender riding out of his mind and an A. Bastianini on a very, very well-sorted uh, year-old Desmo Sedici. Mm, mm, definitely worth a mention as well. The duality of KTM. Brad Bender gets top of Van Man's uh, post-race ratings. The dentist goes to the bottom because the two definitions of motorsport dentistry <laughs> overlap today. Yeah, um, very true. Mickey, eight. what trouble, the man. hell was that? Yeah, fun fact. <laughs> it's definitely not the way to convince KTM to re-sign you for this season. Yeah, fun fact, that's now 10 races since Miggy Oliveira last finished in the top 10 of a Grand Prix. Not great. Not great. Nah. Speaking of not great... This one's gonna ride a few people. Oh boy! Did, oh, did, did, can you say? Can right. you, we've, uh, we've gone back to our old friend, Moto Free controversy. Everybody loves that, don't they? On this show, we've never talked about that here, right? Right? Don't all look excited, gentlemen. Look, look. Kit Cam's got his head in his hands. Dude, King looks glum. Dude, I feel bad for Tatsuki. I feel bad for Tatsuki. Oh. He, he kicked his fairing hot, but we're not talking yeah. about that. So, um, in qualifying. Dennis Faggia got a long lap penalty during the race. Uh, and I believe he is not like the only rider that had to serve long lap penalties during the race because there were three of them. It was him. Isn't Guevara. Uh, I want to say Isan Guevara was another mm. one. Yeah. The, and who was yeah, the other Faggia one? Was the, was the big example because he had two separate incidents. He breached, well, he got in the way of riders on a hot lap when he came out of the pit lane in Q2. And he got a back-of-the-grid penalty plus a long lap penalty for that. And then 
for weaving on the main straight at the end of his Q2 lap, he was given another long lap penalty. Um, it was him. Um, uh, yeah. it was him and Guevara were the two biggest defenders of that. It and gave me a lot of stark flashbacks to what we saw at Cota last year. Go on, Cam. And Sergio <sighs> Garcia, who was not penalized. Sergio Garcia, yeah, quite right. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. It was Garcia. The Garcia was yeah. the last one. So it was Fagia. Fagia was the man, was the young man who did the big no-no. Garcia, Guevara also got penalties. Um, with that in mind, do we agree with the stewards' approach to punish based on the outcome rather than action? I know this is... Punishing based on the outcome now, rather than the action was something that came up a lot yeah, during Formula 1 after the first round three. standards like this. Trey? No, never. Hmm. Trey... Dre, you've you've got some thoughts. I, I tell tell us what's on your mind. Get it off your. You chest. know, I don't like starting a segment saying that I agree with Van Man on something, but I agree with Van Man on something. If you know who I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about here. I saw um, Freddie Spencer and his approach to stewarding. I have severe question marks about like at this point freddie spencer's pissed me off more than michael massey ever did as formula one race director and that's saying something um i actually genuinely thought they were going in the right direction after kota last year they gave dennis on a two race ban for that block at 140 miles an hour that set off the chain of events that led to pedro acosta being catapulted off the front of his bike um, at speed, it was a horrible, well, one of the most horrible incidents no I've ever hyperbole, watched live. By the way. No, no hyperbole, he was, was catapulted thought, off his bike. Yeah, I thought he was dead the first time I saw that. I, I don't know to this day how he walked away from that. Um, I, for a second, thought we were going to see a posthumous world champion. I'm not exaggerating here. Um, the whole point of that was that and it was and in in Dennis on you small defense he was not the only man weaving on that day Sergio Garcia did the same thing and he was not punished again same here in Qatar this weekend he got away with that one again and now you've reduced that punishment to seemingly one long lap penalty because nobody got hit and I don't like this way of thinking We've like this has been a rule in the book for half a decade. Because I remember Yaman yeah, Mir got clapped with this in 2017 for weaving on the front, the back straight at Aragon. You know that massive one kilometer long downhill straight at Aragon. Yeah. He weaved. He was given a, a post race six place grid penalty for it. So this rule has been in the book. This is not a new thing, and yet we've still got the weaving that got somebody banned for two races not being completely shut out of the sport yet to the point where if it's just a long lap penalty, people will still do it. It's not enough of a deterrence. Dennis Forgia finished that race in seventh place. We're starting from the back of the grid and having to do two long lap penalties. The... It's a hell of a ride, but you debate whether or not he should have been able to take that ride in the first place. I can't believe I'm saying this because I don't normally like dealing with extremes, you've got to start parking these dudes. You've got to start saying, you know what? You're a danger to your fellow competitor. You sit this one out. Because you can't go much further down the line of in-race penalties than what we've already seen. We saw Pedro Acosta last year. He had to start from pit lane. He won. Like, that's not a strong enough deterrent, because if you back your own pace and it's strong enough, you can still easily finish in the top 10 due to the infighting that normally happens in a Moto3 race. So, <sighs> I, don't know what, how, I don't know how you feel about this, Cam, or King, if you want to chip, because I know, King, you, you, you follow stewarding quite closely to an extent, but is it just me or thinking, like, am I crazy to think we've got to start parking these dudes? We've got to start talking about race bands? As I don't normally go this far down the road, but I'm, I don't think I'm being left with much choice in my line of thinking. Like, least. I think in terms of weaving on straights, penalties need to come immediately. Where if you see someone doing it, they need to take a drive through, like, they need to take a ride through that race. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd have no problem with that personally because we saw it at the end of the race as well. Garcia did it again, got away with it. Like again, I, I just, I, I the the mind boggles. I mean, Cam, what do you think? You know, we're only six months moved. Because you've been watching bike racing just as long as I have. Yeah. Um, you know, we're only six months removed from that. You know, we the term is overused, but that airplane crash around Coda. It was. Um, mm. And it gets to the point where, as you said, pegging these guys back in races is only doing so much because of the inherent nature of Moto3, the pack racing that it creates. And at mm-hmm. the same time, fines only punish the teams that are worse off financially. These guys, and we, we've addressed it quite a few times here, they are paid, their careers depend on pushing the limit. And you need to define where that limit is. Otherwise, they're going to keep going over it. And in this case, someone's going to get hurt. Probably worse. You're not protected on what, You're not protected on a motorcycle. That is the inescapable fact of motorcycle racing. You are inherently in more danger than you are in car racing. And we've seen weaving cause enormous accidents in car racing. Fatal accidents in car racing. The stewards need to put their foot down and tell these guys, hey, if you're gonna ra- if you are gonna ride your motorcycle like this, don't don't show up tomorrow. Or it's going to keep happening. You, you, you've got to make an example out of these dudes. like. And we thought we did last year <laughs> with the weaving, and then we're right back to it. Like, I don't know. Did, 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 in, at Cota, did they catch Freddie Spencer on a bad day? Was was, was that it? I, like, I mean, Gar- Garcia this... did it. <laughs> F- Fagia did it and got a penalty. Sergio basically mirrored his move behind him and was not penalized. He did not receive a penalty for his actions in Q2. So I, 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 and Garcia is one of the most aggressive riders I've ever seen in Moto3, and he keeps getting away. He finished second on the day. He had already served the long lap penalty in that race for taking for taking a rider out um, by by you missed his breaking point and he plowed into the outside of a rider. I think it was Carlos Tatai in the middle of that race. He'd already served a long lap penalty and he still finished in second. He lost the race by three hundredths of a second over the line to Andrea Mino. Two weaves from Garcia in the race and in Q2 was not penalized. It's a joke. It's it's a fucking joke. I I, I, I can't stress this enough that if you think for, I know a lot of you guys who are watching this or listening to this are, are Formula One viewers. We scream in F1 about the inconsistency of the stewarding. And if you think it's bad on four wheels, it's even worse on two. And you, you've got to start race banning. Like at this point, grid penalties don't do shit. Group penalties don't matter in Moto Three because there's leading groups of twenty all the time in this in this class now. Everyone's you slowing each other down. You need to be talking pit lane start minimum over the course of the yeah. race, and we I, need pit lane starts, Cam. Minimum, 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 minimum pit lane I, starts now. Honestly, be, I'd rather it start in a race outside of the pack. <laughs> effectively, and that would be that would be an effective deterrent. But even then. If someone if someone is enough of a just sheer riding freak, they might be able to get back up and undo most of the damage of that penalty. If it's yeah, that's, this egregious that's why I make level, the argument. Yeah. That's why I make the argument. If you're going to penalize someone, you have to do it during the same race because yeah. effectively, if you're if you're forced to take a drive, if you're forced to take a ride through during that same race, the pack's gone. Yeah. A ride through in bike racing is even more of a deterrent because in bike racing, the pit lane speed limit is much slower. I think it's 50 kilometers an hour in MotoGP compared to the 80, for example, you'd get in Formula One. That's about 25, 30 seconds. In Moto3, that's your race over. You're not scoring points. Like, Get rid of the long lap penalty. It, it it's not a strong enough punishment anymore. Well, well, like look, for me, for, in Moto Three, it's about two seconds. <sighs> for me, motorcycle racing, and as much as we love, I mean, we we just gushed over a phenomenal MotoGP race. 
as we do so often mm. here. Great Moto Three race. Good Moto Three race. We had a good Moto Three race that had a mo had a that had a photo finish through it. Yes, there was violence. Yes, there was aggressive booze, but you know everybody got to back to the flag safely. We're but, just but we here's just the thing: motorcycle like racing is dangerous enough. A lot enough. of these riders don't pick up. Bags. I don't want to see us bury more riders. No. We lost three yeah. good ones last year, as it is. We, 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 all, we already yeah. went through enough of it. Yeah. And we had a big to-do about teens on motorcycles. And I don't think getting teens off of bikes... An aggressive is, rider is an aggressive rider is, is an aggressive is the rider. Song. The number next to their age does not matter. Dennis Fodge is 21 years old. He's been here five years. Dennis Fodge just seems like a fine enough dude, but he, he, he rode yeah. like... He broke like a nut. Yeah, this there's one just 21. Sergio Garcia is 20. This is year three of Sergio Garcia. Like, the age limit argument, in my opinion, is even more bullshit than it was when I first talked about it at the end of last year. I didn't think year. that was possible. Um, it does not matter. Like, it does not matter. They could be... If, if a 21-year-old and the man who was Bookie's favorite to win this championship is out here weaving into people and interfering in qualifying laps on purpose, I'm sorry. Like... Putting an 18 age cap is a bit like putting a band aid on a gaping head wound. It's not going to fix anything, okay? Like, seriously, that argument should be dead in the water by now if it wasn't already. And I don't care what any man with a man wants to tell me otherwise in response to that. Like, you need to. Like, it's in cages. The long lap penalty, kill it. Kill it with fire. It doesn't solve anything. Like, you need to find... You want, you want to use the long lap penalty. Ways of, no, no. Use that for, yeah. you know, incidents in race. Like what we saw. Like what we saw with Ayagara, where he was just a little too saucy with an overtaking move. Something like that. Sure. Something as but severe if, as if, weaving for... in qualifying like that. Where you are, you are actively endangering yeah, I... the riders around you. Just pit lane him. Minimum. Yeah, I I'd argue the wording of irresponsible riding is far too vague and needs to be refined in the rule book, but yeah, that's I, I'd, for another yeah day. I'd probably split into two categories mm. where like mm. reckless riding on straights and reckless riding in corners are two different worlds. Yeah, there's a difference between yeah, a, a, there's so, a yeah. difference between a racing move gone wrong and actively riding your bike in a dangerous way. Yeah. Yeah, bring back uh, bring back the ride through penalty. Institute pit lane starts if it's not in a race. And if I'm if if I was the stewards, three strikes and you miss a race, and then add one for each subsequent weave or any extreme penalty afterwards. You know what? I think that I think you you just hit the nail on the head. In a a year, I think I think you just hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. That that's how I look at it. Spinning it back around to a positive before we get out of here as well. Anything else leap off the page to you, fellas, in what was, I still think, a pretty damn good cat on here? Go Robert to Cameron Bowman! Top 10 finish mode 2, baby! Let's go! USA! 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 Oh. You know, American mm. exceptionalism aside for a second, um, you know, I mentioned it, I may have mentioned it on the season preview that, and it's mm. almost a comical trope that if you put Alicia Spargo on a bike that's just a hunk of garbage, he he turns into like Valentino Rossi with another <laughs> gear. And if you put him on a bike that's actually capable of competing for podiums, he's just average. But fair play to him. Aprilia looked like they have a good bike, and this weekend, Alicia Spargo was comprehensively carrying Aprilia all weekend. He showed up, and he showed out. Maverick Vinales, who, let's not forget, Made Alicia Spargo look average at Suzuki. Maverick got was just annihilated this weekend. All weekend. So, fair. Yeah. Fair play to Alish. He, he, he rode well. He rode yeah, really well. Yeah, I was going to say, it's it's not a fluke anymore when Alicia Spargo is challenging for podiums now. I mean, the man's genuinely got better as a rider. He gets a lot of hate on social media, and I'm not entirely sure Hopefully why. Spargo's I really do. like Alish. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Uh, this was like the first time that I'd learned about the poll has the reputation of as a hothead. And yet he did kind of, he did overshoot his way out of a victory. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, get it. 
I, I, I don't get it. I don't get why this? people shit on the Aspargaro so much. Like, I know many friends of mine that are GP fans that don't like the Aspargaro brothers, and I've never understood why. Um, they're both very good riders, and yeah, third and fourth on the day. It's were they in the Epstein uh, book no, somehow? I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't no, get it. Thank God. Um, I want to say shout out to Sebastiano Vietti, who on the same weekend that Valentino Rossi became a dad. Congrats to the the, the Valian family. Um, we'll be celebrating that new dad's film. We'll probably we might just come out of retirement Doc, next Doc, week. Doctor Dad. Um, <laughs> Doc, the, the Doctor Dad, which is Doctor yeah, Ali Dad. This is, this is terrifying. For that same weekend, we had. Two Academy guys winning in Moto3 and Moto2. Andrea Migno in Moto3. And then Celestino Vietti, out of nowhere, pounding the Moto2 field um, to start his second season in Moto2. Won that race by over six seconds. Everybody will thought, even us on the Discord, thought this is going to be the Pedro Acosta show. No, uh, that, the Vietti opposite completely happened. dominated that race. Mm, yeah, not, the, not entirely Acosta's fault. He was kind of put out to turf by Jake Dixon, which got the bt sport crowd out there going Ooh, i don't know um which i thought was quite funny but uh vietti was was superb in that moto 2 race so that was well worthy of a shout out and that was a great bar fight for third as well between agura oh, Fernandez, that was... uh sam i Lowe's don't know and tony arbolino they crashed they just <laughs> didn't go down <laughs> if you go on to motorsport101.com and you Ura, yeah, if, crashing if into you Fernandez. go on to mostwater1.com and you read my review of the race, there is a picture in there of Agura already mid-accident, and I say, he saved this. <laughs> and you figure it out, well, how? <laughs> Basically using Augusto Fernandez a crutch. He saved great. this by... Ah, uh, yes, the old Gran Turismo 2 yes, eight-wheel yes. cornering if, if, strategy. If in doubt, use the other car as a blocker. Uh, um, that, that works one. That works wonderfully for well. For me... What about you, Cam? Biggest thing standing out from this weekend. If I were to have picked any Ducati rider to be leading the Ducatis in the championship, not just leading the championship, mm. I would have bet the whole farm on Pekko Benyaya. Oh, how wrong I am. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. No, and yeah, the, the second of the Ducatis, Johan Zarco of all people. Yeah, it's it's a it's a uh, yes, the, the, the two, new, two of the three the least new peak likely of Ducati, um Grassini and Premac. <laughs> of course. Just like just like the form book foretold. Um and yeah, I, I wanna borrow a page from what King said about IndyCar last week when they were their first race. I'm leaving Qatar as a bike fan and part time pundit thinking I have no better idea who's going to win this championship or what's going to happen when we get to Indonesia next week. Isn't that wonderful? Hopefully <laughs> like, the track will be cleaner like... than it was in testing, because, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm holding out hope for, for KTM, yeah. the fact that Bender was able to finish so high, especially at a track that normally suits the Ducatis. King is all yeah, in yeah. on the KTM narcotic. <laughs> oh, no. Ooh, that, that. It, it's it's just it's just yes. the power of the, the Lord, the, the Lord Himself, the Great Lord Binder. We love Him, and uh, may He ride into our hearts and into King, bringing back his KTM stand title yes. on Discord. He mentioned last week. <laughs> Moto GP is back next weekend in what is an absolutely friggin' ridiculously loaded uh, weekend of motorsport in a couple of weeks' time on March 20th alongside IndyCar's XPEL 375 and something called Formula 1 starting its season in Bahrain, apparently. that, that That's a thing. Uh, next time around, we'll be previewing that. Keep an eye out on our social media for more on that very, very soon. But uh, until then, the place you can find us one more time are on YouTube.com forward slash Motorsport101 or on Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport101 or on Instagram, Motorsport101pod. Um, our Twitter at Motorsport underscore 101. Our personal handles on the screen right now at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, at Ryan Eric King, at CBuckley917. All of our other details are on the website, Motorsport101. Check that out if you want more insight from me on that MotoGP race. And ask Dre as well. There's a couple of interesting bike questions that was in there as well. The March version should be coming out in a couple of weeks' time. So look forward to that as well. Keep uh, keep your eyes peeled on social media as well for more on what we're going to do with the F1 season preview. So until then, 
We'll see you back for more MotoGP on March 20th in Indonesia. Brand new track. Hopefully it's been cleaned up and resurfaced since the test because there was a lot of flack regarding that. So who knows? We'll have to wait and see what happens down there. Whatever happens, we'll be there for it. But until then, I've been Dre Harrison, they've been RJ O'Connell, Cam Buckley, and Ryan Eric King. I'm going to bed because it's ten past two in the morning. Sayonara, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. Later, y'all. This new Motorsport 101 After Dark.